Hey guys, this is Lisa and part of the reason I started this channel was because I wanted to normalize conversations around love and sex and I was hoping that as my audience grew, some cool people would help me do that and so today I'm so excited because I have Rohan Joshi. Oh my god, I'm cool people. I've never been cool people before. Ah, Rohan Joshi. Or did all the other cool people say no and now I'm stuck here? Is that? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Rohan Joshi with me. Okay, let's start <laughs> with what you're like in love. What I'm like in love? Oh. I think what I am like and what I sort of will be like going forward in the future in love because I'm currently single um but I think that's changed that's exciting. drastically I mean is it though um <laughs> it, it's a combination of exciting jaded all of those things but um I think because I'm about 35 now and the last time I fell in love I was 25 years old um and I think the way you sort of love in your 20s and the way you love in your 30s is very very different because I think you have a very um romantic idealized notion of what love is um when you sort of fall in love in your 20s because i think all your cues that you take about love come from either pop culture or um you know what you're told by relatives and family and what i found is 9 times out of 10 uh, family and relatives instead of engaging with the reality of love will just sell you platitudes about you know togetherness and forever and end of time and all of those things without actually um telling you anything about the fact that love is actually hard work it is on a day to day basis right it's hard work it's not grand gestures it's a lot of little things showing up every day kind of like any other job in that sense i think my definition of love in my 20s the simplest answer here is my definition of love in my 20s was way more emotional my definition of love in my 30s is a little more pragmatic but i was very much into my sort of first proper relationship which again sort of happened in my mid 20s i dated through college um but i wasn't in any like serious serious long term relationships all of through college and of course i went through that phase um explore all of those things um sexually late bloomer all of those things but um when i did sort of meet the person i dated uh, long term um i sort of threw myself into it pretty emotionally uh, so did she and um yeah that's pretty much how we played it okay so what do you think you learned about love and and how has that sort of shaped what you look for in a partner you said you're single right now what, how would you sort of if you could i sure. know it doesn't work that way no, but no, if course. you could list out right. the qualities that would make the ideal girlfriend what would they be for you i think at this point what i'd look for the most is just somebody who's willing to honestly engage in a conversation and the realities of the complications of love as opposed to going into the relationship just idealistically you know going that you know we would definitely be together for forever we would definitely be all of those things um i think right now what i'm looking for in a partner is somebody who would engage honestly in all of the complexities of love and all of the pitfalls of it because i just feel like that would enable us to work better together at building a relationship you're sold this thing through your life where you're told that um a proper life or an ideal life or um the well lived life is one in which you find a partner and then build a life with that partner um but i'm coming to find that we live in a world and we live in a time where it is also possible to have an entirely complete an entirely whole um an entirely emotionally satisfied an entirely sexually satisfied um an intellectually satisfied and stimulated life that does not necessarily involve a long term partner i think i'm also at that age where i realize that um and this again sounds very idealistic and out there but i realize that there's also a difference between um having a partner your whole life and um being able to parent a child with somebody oh i think it's possible to make a distinction between the two um i think it is because again one of my learnings through life uh just looking at all of the relationships in my life and this is whether through their relatives or friends and watching relationships that have worked and relationships that have not worked um for me i think the single biggest learning has been that it is possible to be a terrible partner and a great parent For and sure. vice versa mm. and vice versa the two are not necessarily linked you can be an amazing parent and a terrible partner you can be a terrible parent and an amazing partner do you um, want to have kids and i don't know i'm 50 50 on that right now i don't know whether i want kids or not because you're so lucky though that you are 35 and you can be 50 50 on it see i, I don't agree. have that fucking sure. luxury exactly so unfair i understand that i have biological luxury I, yeah, here man. i understand that i have a lot of biological privilege here coming into Men this conversation are so lucky so you said something okay. that was interesting you said you were a late bloomer actually yes. yes elaborate <laughs> um i did not um i didn't have sex for the first time until my 20s and even then it was extremely um sporadic 
uh, sexual activity was extremely sporadic and um, so and and I also very much lived in a culture where there was very little way for me to access just information about sex. There wasn't really anybody to talk to. Um, we didn't have sex education in school. Um, it wasn't really a topic that came up with my parents. And this is, it's not like they were aggressive on the subject or not, but it was just, fact is, belonged to a generation where that sort of communication was not just a thing that came up. Um, so all the information I got about sex either came from discussions with friends that were woefully ignorant at the time. We all were. And then when I was about sort of, 15, I was about 15, 16 when the internet hit India for the first time. So I was kind of that sort of ground zero for that, I would call it ground zero for generation porn. Um, that point at which puberty and pornography hit simultaneously. <laughs> um, and there was no guidebook. And um, I think one way or another, and as much as it kills me to admit this in a world where I'm like, no, everybody should have access to pornography and all of that. I just wish that there had been somebody to contextualize that pornography for me. Mm -hmm. um, I wish there had been somebody to contextualize just all sexual information for me. Because at that point, I was just taking it in and there was... Because on some level, it's not all pornography's fault. That I mean, let's face it, yes, the language and the visual language and the visual dynamic of pornography can at times be extremely abusive can at times be extremely sort of one-sided from a gender perspective. Um, one of the things that I find, and this is darkly funny and a little sad about pornography, for example, is if you ever go to an ordinary porn site, um, the language is extremely harsh. Um, there'll never be a video titled just, you know, like cute couple having great sex where both orgasm. It's always um, chick drilled, chick nailed, girl gets pounded. Um, so the language of pornography is inherently very violent. The power dynamic there is very violent. At the same time, um, you are also getting an exposure only to a certain very idealistic body type. And there is nobody to contextualize that oh, for you man. and go, this is not what a woman's body looks like. This is not necessarily how a woman will respond to your sexual cues. This is not necessarily how a woman will respond during sex. And that doesn't necessarily mean she's having a terrible time. This is a little theatrical. Uh, exactly. all, and there's nobody to contextualize any of and that for you. this is not you. even necessarily how a man's body will look. Mm, exactly, right? This you is know? not what all penises look like. No. This is not, this is, this is a, for want of a better word, this is a 1% of penis. This is a 1% of penis. This is uh, all of those things. Um, yeah. And because there's none of that contextualization, um, and while I'm speaking for myself here, um, I, I, I'm sure this is something that happens to a lot of people. Um, there's a huge amount of dissonance from um, what pornography has taught you and what your actual first few sexual encounters and experiences are like because you and you come out extremely confused because you're like that didn't look and sound anything like porn does um so and you're suddenly left there with feelings of everything from inadequacy to uh, confusion to just a little bit of shame to um, all of those things while it also feels good no doubt about it um but i think as a result of that what happened is it just sort of it creates it makes sex very intimidating it makes sex very scary um it's sort of because you're like you've been told this is the ideal by pornography, which is a completely false ideal. It's like being told that if I work out, I will become like the Hulk yeah. tomorrow, right? Which is on some level, everybody needs to look at the Marvel movies and go, that's special effects. That's not what real life looks like. Interesting. What was, what was your experience like? And again, I'm asking this because I obviously have no access to the female perspective on what so, sort of coming into the world of sex I is like. I actually as never really watched porn. I just never, I don't know, mainstream pornography created mm -hmm. for the male gaze. And I think maybe women will, um, lots of women might share this reaction to it maybe Not more surprised. than men do. It didn't do anything for me. And so I had actually a really wonderful um, That's fantastic because that's going to be my next question. So is there less dissonance? It's really romantic in... actually. That's actually, really like, cool. I mean it's messy and you kind of it doesn't really work. Sure, as of course. a woman yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know man like the it's not as easy. It doesn't just it doesn't just like sure. everything doesn't just fair. fit. You know? Sure. Fair. Fair. Absolutely. <laughs> um, it takes a while. It's not of as course. easy as it looks. In learn, in the... man, learn. There are yeah. so many wise words being spoken it's, right it's, now. It's going. It's like, bound to be messy, painful, kind of like awkward. But I was really happy that the person I was with was a really, really respectful and extremely affectionate and like. That's kind um, of fantastic honest person and so the, sure. whole, the feel of it was very like we're in this together and mm -hmm. it, and it was kind of like cheesy and romantic he'd gotten like strawberries That's, and whipped cream oh, and candles and, like, it was, 
Oh. Actually, I mean, yeah, it was really cute. But it wasn't, we didn't have great snacks. You know, the first time is not going to be great. Atmosphere like, was on. all of it. No, it's not. It's not going right? to be. It's going to be, it's one of those, it, it's kind of like watching an art film for the first time. Way more questions than answers exactly. at the end of it, right? And, I mean, as a Way woman, more questions than like, answers at the end of the experience. It's like a whole, I mean, it's like you have to go to college for five years before you have a degree. Yeah. I feel like you have to be having sex for a while before this you is, realize This is also woman, true. Yeah. How yeah. orgasms function. It's not like... Mm-hmm. You know, and then so you, in, but yeah. because you watch porn, you feel like maybe you have to scream and shout and pretend like it's fucking the best sex ever. Same. You that know, happened to me the first couple of times know. where I'm like, this person is not responding loudly. I must be terrible. I don't know. Maybe I was terrible. But um, yeah, huge dissonance it's, between it's real life versus and reality, right? It's Which absolutely expectations versus better. reality. It's basically like the perfect, this thing is like, have you, like you watch Kuch Kuch Hota Hai, all right? And you know Karan Johar movie and you look at you look at the school in Kuch Kuch Hota Hai and you go, man, I wish my school was like this. <laughs> but the fact is, you live in India. Your school is not like that. This is a movie school. And you know, on some level you have to recognize that this is not what real life school is going to look like. Sex is like that. Um, you have the Karan Johar idealistic version of what you think it'll be. But in real life, it's a little way more Anurag Kashyap. <laughs> <laughs> Especially initially. It's, it's, yeah. initially, 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 way way more handheld Anurag Kashyap um, this but, thing but than but it Anurag is. Kashyap ah, is brilliant as well, right? Like, so it is, of course it is. Of course like it is. To be but it's just the dissonance. Appreciated. It's just the initial dissonance. Um, and yeah. this is, of course, personal experience. All I meant to say is that even though it might not meet your expectations of what you thought it should look like. Mm-hmm. It's not bad. No, no, no. It's not it's bad at all. It's pretty wonderful. It's just not what you were told it In should fact, the like, only lament you know? here is it would be given that it's it's a confusing experience. Mm. It would just be nice if it were possible to come out and have somewhere you could turn to for context about that experience without yeah. feeling any shame about it. Exactly. If there was a parental figure or an authority figure that you could immediately go up to and be like, this happened. It was good, but kind of confusing. What do I do with these feelings? Um, because if, when you don't have somebody to contextualize for uh, it for you, that feeling of inadequacy can go on for a really long time. That's right. That feeling of confusion can go on for a really long time. It can almost sort of maybe turn you off the experience going that if this is what sex is, then I don't know that right. it's something that I want to do. It, it's a little scary um, and all of those things, right? So I feel like the lament here is just really for that lack of machinery um, to contextualize information mm. for people. And it just comes back to that point is I think we're finally lucky that we live in a world where there's content like this and just the ability to talk to peer groups on anonymous yeah. encrypted platforms like WhatsApp. Um, I wish, I mean, my my vision, my like dream is that we get to a point where you don't have to talk about this anonymously, you know, exactly. where it's perfectly fine. Like, which is why the, I feel like the stuff. sexpert column in the Mumbai Mirror oh, is such Mahindra a huge thing. We laugh yeah. at it it's, and it's funny at times, but just the fact that there is a daily column that addresses, um, and you know, sometimes people are like, are those questions fake? Are those questions real? Honestly, I don't care. Because even if some of those questions are fake, the smart thing that the column does is they will be about such prime basic sexual inadequacies Mm. that whether the question is real or fake, the learning that you get from his answer um, for somebody who probably has no machinery to contextualize that information for them, I think is hugely important. Just being able to, like just an answer where he tells a woman that it is completely normal for her to... um, you know, that lubrication is a normal thing. Um, It takes time for lubrication. That's a normal thing. Um, Erections can be erratic. That's a normal thing. Um, Man, sometimes just hearing those simple things really, really like eases people's minds, I'm sure. For sure. Because, yeah, and I think we need, like you said, way more of that. Way more of that. Mm -hmm. Way more of that. Okay, question then, since we're talking about Ask the Sex Expert and all of that. Yes. Why are Indian men so reluctant to use protection? I don't know. It's an ego thing, maybe. It's a masculinity thing, maybe. It's also a possibly total, like, um, a delusion about your own invincibility thing, maybe. Possibly. I and also know, confidence man. about um, your ability to pull out on time, uh, which is the most misguided kind of you, confidence you on earth. Because guys, so orgasms are like Indian guests. They come without telling you. They just <laughs> ring your doorbell. They don't inform you in advance. <laughs> yes. They're like your relative. So you can say, I'll pull out in time or whatever. But that doorbell can really ring anytime. You have no idea. Yeah.